Thomas Peshak, uh, our last guest before the break, before the lunch break. Thomas is a, a winner this year for singles in both nature and the environment category. Um, this is the sixth time you've won World Press. Stop counting. Um, uh, Thomas is a trained marine bi biologist who chose photography when he realized that his images could have greater conservation impact and reach a wider audience than, let's say, drier scientific statistics. He spends, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read this somewhere, that you spend close to 300 days. In a bad year, it's about 300. In a good year, it's 200. On or in the water. And uh, his stories are published mainly in the National Geogra Geographic magazine. And to shoot the extraordinary images that uh, won the awards, um, he spent time on two of the most remote islands on Earth, the Galapagos in the Pacific and the Marian Island of Antarctica. Thank you very much for your presentation. As a kid, I used to love Godzilla. And I was distraught when my parents first told me that Godzilla is not actually a real animal. Now fast forward 35 years later, I'm shooting a story for National Geographic in the Eastern Pacific, and I discover that I was lied to all those years ago. Godzillas are actually real, and they live in the Galapagos Islands. Now, like a canary in a coal mine, these islands really foreshadow the impacts of biodiversity in the wake of global warming. You know, they are a epicenter of climatic extremes. You know, in the West, the in the West, the water can be so cold that tropical species like sea turtles have to actually, you know, move out of the water to warm up if they want to survive. And at the same time, the air can be so hot that these sea lions have to basically go back into the water so they don't overheat. This is a crazy, crazy climatic environment. Now, the biggest hurdle for a photographer trying to shoot a climate change story is, how do you make images of things that are only gonna probably happen in 10, 20, or 50 years' time? How are you gonna visualize those things without being able to show your audience consequences? How are they gonna care and act? You know, with overfishing, it's, it's easy. You, know, you can see the act. And the consequence, and here we're looking at, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dead sharks. Here the connection is relatively easy. With climate change, it's a much, much harder nut to crack. However, here the Galapagos Islands really came to my rescue. And, you know, extreme local events, they're called El Ninos. Every five to ten years, you know, the, the water warms up, the rainfall increases. And the sea level actually rises for six to 12 months. It's almost like we have this mini simulation of exactly what will happen and what the scientists are predicting is going to happen with climate change in the future. So uh, in 2016, I spent six months in the islands to document the impact of this most recent El Nino event on the local iconic flora and fauna. Now, marine iguanas, <laughs> they are the icon of the Galapagos, and they look fierce and invincible. However, they are incredibly fragile, and the difference between life and death for them is really only a few degrees in temperature. Now, you know, they, they dive in the ocean for food. They graze on cold water algae. Godzilla is a vegetarian, which is always a big surprise to everybody. Underwater? I don't have the luxury of long telephoto lenses. You know, to get you know, decent imagery, I have to use a wide angle and I have to get close. You know, you know, one foot, two feet at the most. Water really robs you of clarity and color very, very fast. And the animal really has to be so relaxed that it actually lets you into its personal space. So you have to work with a lot of individuals to get one relaxed marine iguana. You know, for me, unfortunately, you know, these are not the only the only animals living in these waters. You know, at one particular dive site, every time I dive right at the edge of the visibility, these large bull sharks arrive. You know, right at the edge, always at the edge. And then I begin to look into the viewfinder. 
I think about you know, composition and lighting, and they begin to stick closer and closer and closer. And when I suddenly look up, boom, they're pretty much right all over you. I am fairly relaxed around large sharks. However, that's only if I can actually see them coming. You know, it, nice conditions here in Mexico, clear water. Even a, you know, even a large great white that's, you know, inc you know, is bold is not really too much of an issue. However, you know, a two meter you know, visibility in Galapagos in this pea soup, it's a little bit spicier most of the time, unfortunately. As the ocean around the Galapagos warm, you know, most of the cold water algae actually dies off, you know, leaving the iguana without any food whatsoever. And if the water remains elevated for long enough, they actually begin to starve. And you can see how, how skinny these guys are, how the ribs are actually almost protruding. And in bad years, up to 90% of the global marine iguana population actually perishes, 90%. Now today, I think more than 200,000 visitors come to the Galapagos every single year. And they make up, I think it's 75% of the local economy. And of course, the marine iguana is top of everybody's wish list. And this is actually the creature that will probably go extinct first. So Galapagos will lose its gold mine first in that regard. And then the other sort of icon in these islands is the Galapagos giant tortoise. And they too are impacted by climate change. You know, tortoise, you know, porn, impacted by climate. You know, the, the mating season actually is triggered by the arrival of the rains. And the sex of the hatchlings in the nest is governed by the temperature of the nest. Too warm, all the hatchlings are male, which in the long term is obviously a major issue. And if it gets even hotter, these hatchlings actually perish and become mummified and die in the nest before they even get to the surface. Uh, the volcano on Isabel Alcedo is one of the wildest places on Earth, and it is home to the largest population of Galapagos giant tortoises. Um, it's a 12-hour hike from hell to get there. The bushes are laden in thousands and thousands of ticks. And the entry ticket is hundreds of bites on all the legs, which itch for up to two months. So, you know, and my camp on the floor might be quite basic. Um, you know, who needs comforts when you wake up in the morning and you actually have you know, this sort of view with these giant tortoises grazing right at your feet? They completely ignore you. You're part of the landscape. You know, this is almost like having a time machine for me. Uh, one of those you know, wonderful experiences. Um, you know, these tortoises really are massive, right? And, you know, in the, in the crater floor, I was looking for a scene that would have looked almost the same 100,000 years ago. I was looking for a picture that would actually, you know, you know really capture the, prim the primordial feel of this place. And looking at this image today, I can, I can still feel the earth rumble beneath my feet. And I can still hear, hear the hiss of that 100-foot plume, you know, you know, steaming into the night air. Um, you know... No, the two most northerly islands are Wolf and Darwin, right, right in the north, north of the equator. And this sort of archway is the gateway into what I call the sharkiest place on our planet. You know, these waters have the highest concentration of sharks. Well, that's a much better microphone. I apologize. And these waters have the, have the highest concentration of sharks of anywhere in the world. And the moment you put your fins in the water, they're right there to say hello, and they stick with you all dive long, most of the time. You know, sadly, even here, climate change is impacting the world's you know, shark paradise. As the water warms, you know, more and more parasites and fungal infections begin to actually attack these sharks. And to survive, these hammerheads have to actually seek out cleaning stations where little reef fish actually peck away the parasites for them to survive. And these waters are also home to the world's largest fish, the largest sharks, the whale sharks. Now, these two silky sharks are between two and three meters long. So you can work out how big that whale shark really is. And these guys don't use cleaning stations. They actually use the giant whale shark to rub up against to dislodge the parasites. Um, what else we got? On land, wolf is incredibly wild. This is a rough place, you know, incredibly steep cliffs, you know, hardly any rain and no permanent water. Uh, it's a tough place to live unless you are a seabird. You know, which, and you can actually now get your food from the you know, very, very rich adjacent ocean. And Nazca boobies like these are incredibly abundant. And they build their nests in amongst these thick, uh, you know, cacti thickets that, that are you know, hard, to, hard to walk through. You know, these birds, the Galapagos finches, which inspired Darwin's theory of evolution, you know, they also live there. However, 
They don't feed on fish. They have to hunt for seeds and insects, which are incredibly hard to find and rare on this island. So what have they done? They've turned to the seabirds for food. And they've become little you know, bloodsuckers, little vampires. You can see they, they peck away at the base of the height feathers until the blood begins to flow. And I've seen up to probably 10 individual you know, of, the, of these little birds drinking on one booby. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? 10 finches drinking on a bit. Anyway. And they drink all day long. This goes on from dawn to dusk. And there's not much the birds can do if they have youngsters because they cannot fly away, of course. You know, unlike in the south, where it's going to get wetter, here in the north it's going to get drier. And it is highly likely that this actual behavior will actually increase as our climate warms. So more vampire and blood sucking for these guys if things remain business as usual. Now, not all of the Galapagos is wilderness. You know, most people are shocked when they visit Puerto Ayora, the economic capital. It's home to 30,000 people. And the isolation that once, you know, really drove the evolution of all these unique species has disappeared long ago. You know, these days, up to 10 flights from Quito arrive a day on these islands, and they disgorge both freight and tourists every single day. The, the sort of boundary between the wildlands and the urban fringe is disappearing, and it's quite normal to, in the dry season to have a giant tortoise in your garage looking for water. That's a common scene. Or you might have to queue behind these guys at the fish market if you want some fresh fish. Now, you know, the, 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 the iconic you know, wildlife in Galapagos has obviously weathered and evolved with climate change for hundreds of thousands of years, but things have changed because they evolved in a largely human-free world. Now, you know, a lot of you know, wild population, are, you know, ecosystems have been decayed, wild populations have been depressed, and of course, the rate of climate change now is greater than ever. So, you know, while I'm happy to see, you know, local efforts on the doorstep in the islands to actually make a difference, this is not a local problem, this is a global problem. And, you know, whether or not Ocean Godzilla becomes extinct in the next, you know, 100 years or so, whether, whether Galapagos' iconic fauna is going to survive, you know, the next century, will largely depend on how the rest of the world is going to respond to what is the single, you know, largest environmental crisis we've ever faced. Now, the Galapagos have also taught me how incredible seabirds can be. I mean, if you endure vampiring on a daily basis, that's pretty badass as far as I'm concerned. And, and this realization is what led to my next National Geographic magazine story. You know, I read and I devoured everything I, I could about seabirds. And the more I learned, the more I actually wanted to know. I went incredibly deep on this research because it was one of those topics that, that really, really fascinated me. You know, we all know puffins, you know, penguins and maybe albatrosses, but there's actually 360 different species. You know, some people have never heard of a shearwater or a storm petrel or this incredible bird called the Inca tern of Peru. You know, what, you know, the one trait that though really, you know, combines all seaweed is that they hunt in the ocean for food, mainly on fish and squid, and they hunt from the surface down to depths of 100 meters or more. You know, they only return to land once a year, and they mainly nest on islands that are pretty, you know, far offshore, very remote, so most individuals never get to really experience the life of seabirds. Um, in one study, I read that scientists had reported that in the last 60 years, we've lost 230 million seabirds. That is, a, that is 73% of the global population has perished in less than 60 years. That, for me, blew my mind. As a photographer, I asked myself, what does such a dramatic plan actually look like? How can I you know, visually convey the absence of 230 million pelicans and boobies and cormorants? How how do I share that information? So I spent months in archives all around the world, you know, looking for imagery that showed these seabird colonies before the declines began you know, 100, 150 years ago. And so armed with a bundle of 100-year-old images, I first headed off to Namibia, to a place called Halifax Island. And you know, this place used to be home to this incredible African penguin colony. Um, I think it was 150,000, 100,000 individuals in in 1896 when this image was taken. And I was there in 2017 when I reshot this picture. And I think that year was an all-time high. There was 2,000 individuals nesting on that island. Major, major declines. Um, I also visited Peru's offshore islands. Uh, this was one, this is you know, an old image from 1907. 
And this used to be probably the largest Pacific pelican colony on our planet. And now all that's really left are the remains and the skeletons of another failed breeding attempt uh, the year before. You know, seabirds have had a pretty tough time in the last few years, or well, last 200 years. You know, we've mined their guano and destroyed their nesting sites. We've collected their eggs. You know, all pollution impacts them both onshore and offshore. Uh, you know, industrial fisheries are taking away the food that they eat, the anchovies and the sardines. And to add insult to injury, you know, they're actually also being, you know, killed. They're hooked by long lines while they're scavenging the bait and they're drowned. And at the peak, I think in the region of 50,000 albatrosses were killed every single year by industrial longline fisheries. I mean, huge, huge numbers. And if that was not bad enough, now climate change and extreme weather events are, of course, you know, maybe putting the final nail in the coffin. Um, you know, seabirds are the most endangered large group of birds on our planet. And one rightly so, rhinos and elephants and sharks are getting, you know, a lot of fantastic media, media bylines. You know, seabirds, unfortunately, because of their lifestyle, have been largely forgotten. You know, and I knew that if I wanted to try to begin to change that, I had to show my audience a place, the holy grail of all seabirds, a place that was so incredible and so packed full of life that you simply couldn't fall in love with it. And Marion Island is exactly such a place. It sits halfway between Africa and Antarctica. And, you know, this is a place that's strictly off limits. And it took about a year of emails and phone calls and meetings and more emails and more meetings and more phone calls and then another round of meetings and phone calls until miraculously I received permission in 2017. So 2017, you know, there's only one vessel, a government icebreaker that actually goes to the island once a year. And luckily in 2017, I was on board with hundreds of tons of gear that is used to resupply the small science station on this island. And you know, a, 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 a traveling through the Southern Ocean and the Roaring Forties is always quite an adventure. It takes about six days to get down there. So it's a long, it's a long, you know, it's a long cruise or not a cruise, depending what you're into. I like these sort of cruises a lot personally, but then, yeah, I'm a bit weird, so I'll figure it out. And this is a 120 meter boat, so you can imagine how high, the, the, the top of the superstructure sits at 45 meters, so you can work out how high the spray actually ended up there. The weather on Marion is horrendous for 359 days every year. You get these low pressure systems that are pushing across and they're bringing in sleet and snow and torrential rain when it is warmer. Um, however, I for once got incredibly lucky when we were helicoptered off the vessel we had this insane window of weather. These mountain peaks in the background have not been seen since 2014. They've been in the clouds the entire time. So you can imagine how, how happy and lucky I felt. And now we're not being dropped off on the western end, which is um, yeah, a wild, wild place, as I'll show you afterwards. A little, a little container home. You know, top of my shot list was this place called the Amphitheater. This is this insane sort of bowl where 24,000 macaroni penguins nest every single year. And these crested penguins are very, very agile, as these rock harpists will show you. This is tricky and tough lava. This is sharp rock, and these guys run through there as if it's nothing. I take an hour for 100 meters to get through that stuff. It is tough, 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 tough. The weather was re What just happened? if I pushed the wrong button. Oh, we're back. Thank you so much up there for saving my, my backside. I appreciate that. The weather was incredible, you know, uh, and I was in a t-shirt and the light was getting sweeter and sweeter. And for this little millisecond, I caught myself thinking, you know what? I think this might be a little bit easier than I thought. Of course, I wake up the next morning and I wake up to the mother of all storms. Even the penguins had issues remaining upright. And I had even more issues. We can raise the volume a bit if you guys want up there. Just get a feeling for the wind. How am I supposed to make pictures of this? <laughs> Lovely, lovely weekend weather on Marion. On memories of that day. 
So it takes 48 hours for the storm to lift, and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to go right back to the amphitheater and try to, you know, you know, continue shooting this this incredible scene. And I arrive there, and of course, almost all 24,000 penguins have disappeared with the storm. Gone for a month, I traveled a thousand kilometers and spent six days on an icebreaker for three hours of photography. Now the light was good, but it was three hours of photography. You know, luckily. Not all species of penguin had abandoned me. These are king penguins, the, the second largest penguins in the world. And every morning, they, they move into the ocean, conveyor belt style, to go offshore and feed. And they feed on squid in deep water off the polar front. So these guys were much more, you know, obliging. Um, you know, the early explorers thought that these guys are actually a you know, different species, but they're actually the chicks of the king penguins. I think they're sinister looking, a bit Al Capone like in trench coats. They make me nervous, these guys, but they are so, you know, they're very, very bold, and they will come right up to you. They peck your feet, and if you sit in one place for like, you know, five, six minutes, they surround you instantaneously, and they look shifty-eyed as far as I'm concerned, these little guys. Now, me and my fantastic assistant, Otto, we were dropped on the western edge of this island, and, you know, we had to be completely self-supported. We were dropped on our own. And we had to carry every piece of gear that we needed. So our backpacks were 40 to 50 kgs each. And, you know, the goal <laughs> was to reach the science station on the east side of the island and reach the icebreaker before she unpacks and heads back to Cape Town three weeks later. Otherwise, Marion would be home for the next 13 months. So there was a bit of motivation beyond just getting the photographs to get our backsides across this island at the end of the day. This is considered good walking weather on Marion. This is a good day. And on these days, we walk for between 10 and 12 hours moving across this island. And sometimes the wind can be so strong, and I'm not kidding, you're actually leopard crawling up mountain passes for a half an hour because you simply, it's not possible to remain upright. And the key is not to lose your sense of humor because otherwise you are pretty much done by, to be honest. And it gets better and better. And you just have to literally just switch off your logical mind and just keep going and going and going and going and going. Now, a lot of individuals, you know, have this, have this sort of romantic notion and the romance involved in being a National Geographic photographer. I want to put that aside completely. Here's a picture of me before and after shooting the seabird story. You know, taking a little bit of a toll here and there. But, you know, that's how it goes. You know, the other big thing I wanted to document on Marion were the, the dancing ground of the wandering albatross. This is the largest flying bird in the world. And the wingspan is three meters. They are, and when you're sitting down, they're basically you know, higher than you are. And they have this insane repertoire of these, you know, um, sky points and, and pirouettes and wing flap. It is absolutely magical. And it looks like a really ballet, but it sounds like a bunch of donkeys auditioning for idols, I promise you. What did they do wrong in their past life to get a you know, voice like this, right? And they look so beautiful. And this is a, a mating, a lecking ritual that goes on in the evenings for hours, and you group up to four to six of these guys just all dancing around each other. tortured you guys enough with this one, I think, eh? <laughs> On the icebreaker back, I sort of tallied so statistics. I like numbers. I'm a former scientist. So I kind of worked out, okay, well, how did you do? So the whole expedition was 38 days long. Uh, we were on the icebreaker for 12 days, so there's no real photography there, what I needed. Um, we walked for 10 days straight. There's no photography on walking days, I promise you. Uh, another eight days, we were confined to the shipping containers because we simply could not and remain upright in hurricane force winds, which leaves, what does it leave? Eight days, I think I said, eight days. That sounds pretty decent, that's 21%. However, you know, in, the, in, the, in, those, you know, in those 21%, I only had 30, 30, 36 hours at the most where the light was even worth getting out a camera, which works out to 3.9% of 38 days. And, and this is actually not bad if you're shooting stories on remote places and you know working on natural history and on conservation subjects. That's a pretty good hit rate, in all honesty. So when epic light presents itself, you really have to just go for it. You know, this is an ice pellet storm with ice pellets going horizontal right at you, but this 
this light is just so incredible. And this was the first good light I'd seen, I think, in six days or in five days. And you're desperate to get out there, but conditions are horrendous. The gear does not survive it very long, and your eyes are pretty much blinded. So you're just waiting for a gap in the wind to dare to get your camera out, which there is no gap. There's a quick gap. And you literally get one picture off before the whole lens is covered in raindrops. And I was out there for about an hour. That rainbow remained for, I think, for like two and a half hours stationary at that location. It simply would not go away. But the weather, of course, also wouldn't let up. Um, wonderful memories of my holiday on Marion Island in the Southern Arctic. But the reward is usually worth it. You know, I'm, I'm always humbled by how, <laughs> how resilient albatrosses are. I mean, these guys are raising their chicks in probably one of the toughest environments on Earth. And albatross chicks are tough, but they are not bulletproof. And there are certain things that even they are completely powerless against. You know, in the 1800s, um, mice were introduced to Marion Island by the whalers and the sealers. And for the first 200 years, you know, there was a coexistence, you know. Um, mice and albatross didn't really cross paths much. However, beginning in 2000, that status quo began to change. And I soon came across fairly grisly evidence of this, you know, you know relationship shift. And high on an almost inaccessible ridge, we climbed up and nearly killed ourselves doing it. But, you know, we came across this scalped and bleeding albatross. Most of the back of its head and neck have been, you know, completely eaten away. But to actually, you know, see the culprit and to see exactly what happens, you actually have to brave the freezing nights of Marion. Now, I apologize already now, but none of you are going to be eating lunch. So here we are, young, a young wandering albatross at night in the tussock grass, and we get the introduced house mouse. They're about twice the size of normal house mice. Um, they've evolved, and there they go on the back, rock climbing. And these birds are not programmed to do anything about mice. It's not in their repertoire. So they, you know, occasionally they'll shake one off. The wind is howling, it's pretty minus six degrees. That's the only reaction you're going to get. And the mice actually live in the albatross nests. A scene from The Walking Dead, that's as best as I can describe it. And a close up. I'll save you from this. I've watched this, I've rewatched this hundreds of times, and I promise you, it does not get any easier to watch, no matter how often you see this footage. Um, <laughs> even in a place as, as remote and wild as Marion, seabirds are facing these crazy, serious, man made you know, risks and threats, but we have a little bit of hope. I mean, these days, the technology is available to eradicate mice from an island the size of Marion, even in this remote location. The biggest downside is, is that it's going to cost $6 million to do so. And we're running out of time because as the climate warms, well, in the past, the winters were so tough, the winters killed off most of the mice population on the island. Now, with the winters getting warmer, the mice, most of the mice are no longer dying, which means their populations are growing and growing and growing. And we can have a situation where mice could predate, you know, half the albatross population in the next 10 years. So it's critical and urgent. You know, luckily, the South African government has pledged um, half the money needed to eradicate, and we have eradication scheduled for, I think, 2020, 2020 provisionally at the moment. Now, this is part of a global seabird crisis story that will be published in National Geographic magazine in the July issue of 2018. And I will certainly torture audiences with this video whenever I can until we've pretty much raised the next $3 million that we need to actually eradicate mice from Marion Island. Um, because if we can't protect a place as, as wild and remote as Marion, what hope is there really for other places on our planet? 
Thank you so much, everybody, for enduring the zombie mouse video. I appreciate it. That was fascinating. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you, Thomas. We're going to have a lunch break, but that was absolutely fascinating. I could have stayed on. <laughs> uh, maybe not with the mouse scene, but uh, much more from you. Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. And congratulations.